Go for it, Harriet. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the Earth Exchange Cafe. Once a month for the last three and a bit years, Trebi and I have been hosting you in your favorite cafe, just the place that you go to where you get your best coffee or your favorite juice or frappuccino or whatever it is. And now after three years, we are surrounded by the books, the magazines, the academic papers. We're hearing the music from activist musicians. We've got artwork all around us and even the tapestries un under our feet and adorning the walls are from those people who have held the radical joy, finding beauty in wounded places, ethos in whatever it is that they've been offering to the world. And so welcome in, pulling up your favorite chair and grabbing your favorite drink on this hot, hot day. And as you sit down and expect this uh, conversation to begin between us and you are an active participant, you realize that we are here in circle with Pat McCabe, Women Stand Shining. And we are so, so grateful and welcome, welcoming to you, Pat, for coming. And we now- Thank you so much for having me. It's great to see you. You're so welcome. And so I'm, I invite you actually, Pat, to give us a, an opening ceremony so that we can hold this conversation within a ritual container. Mm, thank you. So I'll just give a little greeting first and say, uh, and greetings to each and every one. Hey, good morning. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. And um, I'm coming uh, into this space from uh, my daughter's home uh, in New Mexico, right on the edge of our traditional territory. Well, it's in our traditional territory and now in our, alongside our, our government sanctioned territory. <laughs> um, and uh, we're here with uh, all of the, the lambs that are being born um, at this time of our, of our precious churro sheep. So just thinking, kind of telling you what my context is here as I make a, a, a kind of a prayer here for our, for our purposes. And I always like to dedicate these conversations to the higher good. So um, the ceremony would just be a prayer for me. So I'll just say, um, um, hmm. Hmm. Shema, Shache, holy people all around. It's me, Wiyakpa, Naji, we coming before you on this holy day. It's a very holy day of Pitukile. And um, just thank you. Thank you, uh, Creator. Thank you, Holy Mother Earth, for all the beauty, for all the amazing beauty. Mm. I just ask that you take a good look at, at us gathered here at this moment and uh, notice that we're coming together for the purpose of remembering who we are and how we're all related, for the purpose of remembering um, how the five-fingered ones contribute to the sacred hoop of life, for um, learning from all of our elders, from the plants, standing nation, the trees, the stones, the waters, even this holy star shining above, Flying ones, swimming ones, creepy crawling ones, four-legged ones, all those spirit helpers, all the spiritual help swarming all around us. And at this time, I, I do invite all that serves the very highest possibility for life and light and love to be present here. We make a space for you here to inform and to insert in what takes place here. And let this time together and, and what comes from the hearts I'm so grateful that you gave me this heart to, to, to offer, you know, to, to this sacred hoop. I'm a, I'm a pitiful human being. I'm fumbling. I'm a baby. I'm learning, but I do have this heart full of, full of all the feeling. And so I place that here um, in our midst and call on the hearts of each one sitting here, those listening, those watching to make our contribution to this mother earth and to this, this whole beautiful life. Um, and I just ask that all of this serve to uh, help us remember and help, 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 um, help us harmonize with what's already taking place. But I just keep thinking about 
how to be that omnibeneficent presence that all the rest of the life forms are. And I want to be that too. And so let this conversation serve to open that place inside of us where we can begin to understand how to be that omnibeneficent presence that blesses and benefits all. So in that way, let us open and let us begin. So I'll just say for all my relations, Oh, mitakwe oyasin. Thank you. That was really beautiful. Um, I want to start by introducing you and uh, reading from the description that's on your website of your extraordinary work, um, which we'll only be able to just touch on a little bit today. <clears throat> so this is this is what it says about you. Pat McCabe, I'm not going to try and pronounce your native name in your language. Woman stands shining is a Diné Navajo mother, grandmother, activist, artist, writer, ceremonial leader, and international speaker. She is a voice for global peace, and her paintings are created as tools for individual earth and global healing. She draws upon the indigenous sciences of thriving life to reframe questions about sustainability and balance, and she is devoted to supporting the next generations women's and men's nation in being fund functional members of the hoop of life and upholding the honor of being human. So this, it's really, um, it's beautiful and it's a lot. And <laughs> thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I was going to start with one thing, but then after being present for your opening, I want to just plunge right in and ask you about the Diné concept of beauty. Um, Hojo, which is so, it's such a huge part of Diné um, philosophy, spirituality, and life. Could you kind of unpack that concept for us? <laughs> I think my people over millennia have been working on unpacking it. So I don't know that, um, you know, that's going to all happen right here, right now. <laughs> but um, <laughs> So I um, want to, I just give a little bit of background before I launch into that, which is to say that, you know, I, I come from Diné Nation. I was adopted into the Lakota spiritual way of life. And that's how I came to have my name, Weakpa Najinwi, when stand shining. Um, but I want to say that, you know, my grandparents and my parents were taken into Dutch Christian reform residential missionary boarding schools. So my grandparents met in uh, in this missionary boarding school. Um, and then my parents met in the boarding school. My aunt and uncle met in the boarding school. So my family is really, really steeped in what, what took place there. Really, really steeped in this aspect of the founding of this, or I should say the superimposition of this nation upon um, indigenous continent here. Um, and and the, I bring that up in 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 response to your question, Trebi, because I want to say that you know my grandparents, uh, I think, did have a very deep knowledge of of this question that you're asking about, but but they were taught to not talk about it and not think about it and not move from that place very much. Although I still witnessed it in them, I think. Um, by the time by the time my parents came along in that same boarding school system, I mean you got to remember the. The purpose of that boarding school system was to make our people's own culture so repulsive to us that we would never go back. I mean, that was the stated purpose of these schools, right? So by the time my parents and, and that generation was in those schools, um, my father had uh, knowledge of the language, my mother not so much, um, and uh, but they stopped speaking it. Nobody. So by the time I came along, nobody was speaking the language around me. And nobody was speaking of uh, matters like Hosho. Nobody was speaking about our cultural uh, sciences and understandings um, or spiritual way of life or, or a way of or walk. So um, I just feel like it's it's really necessary to name that. So all that is to say that you know I'm 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 a fledgling baby in in our own culture, but but I would say a few things about Hosho. My daughter has a really beautiful poem. My daughter is Lila June Johnston, and uh, she has a really beautiful poem Hosho. O in English alphabet. So you can uh, maybe look up that poem if you like. Um, but so Hojo, when I when I hear that word, um, uh, I, it brings me to this idea that my people have have this this understanding that our baseline, the baseline situation here on Earth, is is beauty. And so I mean that's how that word is often translated. 
but but this 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 understanding of beauty um, is talking about harmony. It's talking about balance. It's talking about thriving, thriving life. It's talking about vitality. It's talking about right mind, right heart, right body, right action. I'm going to say it probably includes this word that I'm that I'm talking about. In fact, maybe maybe this could be a definition in a way of this omnibeneficence in which everything is serving to uplift every other being. Um, but I guess what, what really strikes me about, about that concept is this idea of original beauty. Because, um, I don't know, what do we want to call it? Modern world paradigm, Western world um, is, is, is really inundated, um, infiltrated, I'll say, and into, deep into the psyche about original sin. Um, and so saying that we come from a, a place of flawedness, a place of kind of being behind and needing to catch up, a place of needing to improve, a place of needing to um, achieve and earn a place um, in beauty. And, and so this is a fundamental, fundamental difference between modern world um, basis and, and Dene basis, because when you come from original beauty, uh, that's a really different way of thinking about yourself, and it's a really different place to to move out from. Um, I'm gonna say that uh, you know in 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 our in our in our ceremonial house, and I'm thinking about that because my daughter's having this really beautiful hogan built on her on her land here, and um, it's our traditional um, home. It's a female version in this case. And um, and so they say that the very the way, very way that that structure is made is speaking to the natural order of things. So that's another part of Hojo, is like a it's acknowledging the construct uh, of earth. So there is a there is a construct, just like I don't know, you could say in a house, there's walls, windows, doors. Um, there's ways that you go in and out of places and and do things, and um, and you know you can try to try to walk through walls or try to defy gravity, but it's not going to work so well. So so in that sense, there, there is a construct of earth too, and there's a way to move with it. And so this ceremonial, this ceremonial house, this structure is actually speaking to that mm. order. And so just by walking into that place, you are beginning to, I guess in, in our time now, we'll say somatically come into that place of order and balance and harmony and hold. This is anytime we leave Hojo, Every time we we get confused and 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 fall out of or start believing in something other than this original beauty and start acting out of those beliefs, there's an opportunity to go back into that place. And um, you know they they say that 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 hogan was made um, for our the first our creatrix changing woman who appeared on earth. The holy people um, heard a baby crying on the mountain and and went to to find her and uh, or f find the source of this sound and and they found this baby girl and um and so they were trying to decide what they should do how they should how they should hold her and take care of her you know and so they said we need to to help her understand where she is who she is what this place is all about and so they built this this home for her this hogan and it was describing you know who we are where we are how it is and then it was, and then it once inside, they they sang to her, and these songs um, sang about about this um, construct of earth, about this about this way of harmonizing with with the beauty of earth, and with I guess what Thich Nhat Hanh would call inter interbeing, right? And so um, so that's something that can still take place to this day is to is to go into this, that structure and have that beauty, that harmony, that order sung back into you. And the community does that for each other. So, um, so I guess that's what I think of when I think of that word "hojo." You know how how powerful that that idea is. Here, I agree with you. It's a very very powerful um, understanding and concept. Well, way of life. Yeah, way of life. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so, I wanted to ask you about how you came to your traditions, um, because if your parents um, and your grandparents had been taught that you know forget about them they're repulsive they're awful and yet you have really moved into it uh, and 
and embraced embraced your traditions and are learning from them. How did that happen for you? What what happened in your life that made you decide to go in a different direction? Well, gosh, let's see. Um, I I, I want to say that that um, you know when the I guess when the missionaries came for my grandma. Um, you know, and, and let's remember at that time, any 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 native child you saw anywhere, even if they were with their family or if they were with their, just their siblings, you know, people had a right to just t- take them to any of these schools. Um, that was that was their their rightful place by law from the U.S. government. You know, so that, that always just really strikes me when I think about that, right? But um, so when the missionaries came to my grandmother's house, they only took her. And she, so her siblings um, weren't there. And so she got raised in this way. And then, and then when I was born, she came to live in, in, in our home and took care of me. But I remember going to um, her siblings' home, you know, their traditional Hogan. And I mean, it was a foreign, um, I was growing up in suburban Albuquerque. Right? And so, um, well, one thing I'll say is my, my grandmother, even though she was raised deeply, deeply Christian, um, she had no evangelical tendencies at all. And she, I, what I witnessed was, you know, her just, you know, when her and her sister would see each other, they would just weep, you know, every time tears would come to their eyes and had total love and acceptance for each other. And, and they would speak our language. That was the one time I heard my, my grandmother speak our language. And so it was a very foreign world for me. And, and I'll say that, you know, I, I remember one time they butchered a sheep in my grandmother's honor. And so, you know, um, I'm watching the whole process, watch them get the sheep, watch them cut the throat, watch them, you know, do the whole thing. And then they put it on the fire and then they put it on my plate and I freaked out, you know, because I hadn't seen, so I didn't know where meat came from, you know, and I was like, whoa, you know, and so that was like the wrong thing to do and insulting and such. And, um, and so, you know, what ended up happening for me was I, I was not, I didn't fit. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know there was a way to walk in, in the home. I didn't know, I, I didn't know anything. And so what ended up happening was I got sat in the corner with like a thermos of milk and crackers. And it was like, you just sit there until we're done. And the message to me that went deep in was, you're not one of us and you're never going to be one of us. And we're not even going to try to teach you to be one of us, you know? And uh, I mean, I was really young, like five or six or something when this was happening. And if they didn't think it that I noticed, well, I noticed, <laughs> I really noticed it had a really deep impact on me. So I'm going to say I, I started out kind of very, very far because I I felt very, um, I was terrified actually of being around my own people because I felt like that rejection was going to happen. And I want to say that, you know, I tell that story in, in all, all different parts of the world and everywhere I go where there's indigenous people, when I tell that story afterwards, they'll come up to me and they'll just fall in my arms and they'll cry because that's the story. That's the story of colonization all over the world. This, this confusion and separation and fear, right? So, so I uh, started out being uh, indigenous avoidant. <laughs> like I just didn't want to, you know, but then look at me, I'm indigenous. And, uh, and so everywhere, everywhere else I went, people were like, hey, you're Native American, aren't you? You know, how do you people do this? How do they say that? How do you, you know? And I had no answer. So, um, so I was in a, I was in that, in that proverbial, no woman's land and um it was it was um uh, tearing and so um you know i i uh i and this is also a dilemma that's going on worldwide with indigenous people is this is this sense of being lost not fitting here or there but i think you know when you first asked that question the, the incident that came to mind about how things got rolling was I had this idea. So I started having, um, when I went to college, I started encountering some other indigenous people and I started uh, noticing that they were kind of in the same boat. That and um, so I had this idea that I wanted to start a literary magazine. I wanted to start it and I was going to call it Blood Root. And I was going to enlist native students in colleges, you know, all across the country to submit, which I still think is a good idea. I think somebody should do this. Um, but, um, but anyway, I told my parents about it. I said, Hey, I got this idea, you know, I'm going to start this native American literary magazine. I'm going to call it blood root. And my father turns to my mother and he says, look who wants to start a native American literary magazine. And I was like, wow. You know, so first I got my feelings very hurt. <laughs> and I was, 
and they shot down my idea and they ridiculed me, you know, and, and I just, but then I just thought about it and I thought, well, this is crazy. My father is full blood Diné. My mother's full blood Diné. If I'm not native, like who is right. And, um, and that's, that's, that was a huge moment because all of a sudden I went, wow, what is going on here? Um, you know, uh, I had, and that was when I first began to look at the history that would lead to such a moment where my own parents were looking at me and not seeing a native person. And that's when I began to start looking at, well, what happened here? You know, and, um, and then I, I had this idea and I said to myself, wow, if I don't claim my seat, then we're going to disappear. Like I have to claim my seat because my story is, is the story of an indigenous person in this, you know, in this superimposed nation state. Um, and, and I have to claim that seat or we're not going to be here anymore. The genocide will be complete. Mm. So that was a really key moment in, in deciding um, I better find out what's going on here. I better start claiming whatever I can of this place. And then I'll just say um, one more thing about it, which is that, you know, so I, again, I, I had this sen terrible sense of, of not knowing where I fit. Um, the fallout of attempted genocide as it was, as it came through the residential boarding schools um, brought a lot of trauma in my family. I mean, of course it did. And so I was navigating that. Um, and so I came to a point of self-destruction actually. And, uh, so I was raised in the Dutch Christian reform church myself. And, and then I got sent to East coast, a different kind of boarding school, a prep school on the East coast. And, um, and when I was there, I, I stopped going to church. <gasps> I stopped going to church and it was very, very scary. Very, very scary. Um, but how powerful that 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 hold is. Um, but I broke that hold. And when I did, I said, fine, I'm an atheist. There's nothing. There's just me and whatever I can make happen. But when I came to this moment of realizing that I was self-destructing and I was self-destructing right in front of my children, I, I had this moment of saying, wow, what? I don't want to do this. Because I had watched other elders self-destruct in front of me, you know, and it's very confusing. Again, another... Uh, phenomenon going on for indigenous people worldwide um but in that moment i just called out to something i didn't know what anything and i just said you know if there's something out there i sure could use some help because i'm going down and i'm going to go and what came back from that call very very heartfelt sincere call was i got invited to my very first lakota ceremony i got invited to my first inipi sweat lodge ceremony and when I went in there, I found home. I found home and I found a way to pray and I found a way to connect to spiritual help and to the larger community of life and what they held for human beings. And, 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 I, and I got to step into a different kind of order that was not academic, that was not you know, economics based on money. It was, not, it, was a, it was a very different way and it was what my soul was, was looking for. So that's kind of a, a long answer, but. There you go. Thank you. I mean, I really, I'm really curious as you tell that story about whether, you know, it, what, how your grandma and, and her siblings received your, like your growing interest in being Dene and being an indigenous person because they had that connection already. I mean, did, did you find a kind of a sense of belonging with them that, that your parents did not recognize? I wish I could say that I did. Um, you know, my grandmother passed long before any of this took place. Um, but but there's an interesting story about that. So I I was following. So so I again I was I, I it was the Lakota that answered. It wasn't Dene that answered oh. that prayer, right? And so I started out in the Lakota tradition, and and that's been. I mean, I I just have infinite gratitude for the Lakota people and, and that spiritual way of life because it's been everything and everything that I am and everything that I do is somehow coming out of out of that. That's not to say that what I say and what I do is traditional Lakota always, but but it's inspired from that place all the time. Um and uh you know when I'm in the ceremonies I'm I'm definitely adhering to uh, Lakota tradition as deeply as I possibly can but just in my life public life in the world I, I kind of need to clarify that I think but um so you know the Lakota way led me back to my own people because the Lakota way gave me enough bearing you know enough departure out of modern world paradigm 
so that when I finally came back and began to approach Diné, my Diné people and Diné culture, Diné ceremony, I met a few elders who could receive me, you know, and, and, I, and I had to walk through my fear. But the reason I walked through my fear is I, I went out on a vision quest. We say we, we cry for a vision in the Lakota way, humblecha. And um, a white buffalo calf woman came to me in that, during that time. And she was telling me, she took me up on this hill and we looked out. She said, tell me what you see over there. And I said, I see four, four mountains. She said, that's right. She said, that's oh. your people's home. Wow. And she said, uh, she said, you know, you come from there, right? You know, you come from those people. Because, you know, I've been like deep in Lakota way. And she said, I said, yeah, I know. She said, well, there's a reason that you were born to them and not to us. And it's time for you to go find out what that reason is. And I got to tell you, that kind of broke my heart because I felt like she was sending me away, banishing me or something, you know. Oh. <clears throat> but she said, yeah, you need to go find out. She, and she and bringing up the Hojo, she said, your people have a very un specific understanding of beauty. And it's really important for you to go and, and learn what that is. And um, and she said, so this year I'm, I'm asking you not to do Lakota ceremony, which oh, I, I cried for like two days while I was sitting in my spot for Vision Quest. And I was like, oh, no. And she said, yeah. So she told me you need to go and see. And so what was really interesting about that is my daughter, my cousin had had the first um, woman's initiation ceremony in my family in four generations. And my daughter and I had gone to see that. And since that time, my daughter had been asking me, mom, am I going to have that? Am I going to have that? And I was like, er, er, you know, and then of course the only right answer is to say, yes, of course you're going to have that. And then I was like, oh my gosh, how am I going to figure that out? So I actually went back to my grandma's relatives and I said, even if they're going to humiliate me and make me feel terrible, I, I will do this for my daughter because she really, really wants it. And so I went back to them and, you know, my grandma's sister had passed by that time. So I'm talking with her children. And I said, you know, my daughter's going to need to have a place for ceremony. I wonder if we could come and do it out at your place. And they said, well, the Hogan that, you know, our mom used to have, we, we use it for storage now. And I was like, oh, no, <laughs> you know. And so this was a really big realization for me, too, because I just felt like my own people who were just carrying on deeply in the traditions as I had witnessed it when I used to go visit from my with my grandma, you know, and I realized, no, it's 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 changing, you know, it's maybe even disintegrating in some ways in some places. And um, and and so I tried to negotiate with them. I said, well, we'd be happy to, like, clear it out and put it back if we can use it. And they were like, mm, no, I don't think that's going to work. We don't really do that here anymore. And I was just like, wow. So, um, so anyways, uh, you know, after white Buffalo calf woman told me that um, the way the, the womanhood ceremony works is, is it has to occur after the young woman's first menstruation after her first moon time and before her second. So you don't get to just put it on the calendar and schedule it. It's like, it's totally governed by by the body, right? And it's a huge thing. It's a huge ceremony. It's four days, and oh man, it's very involved. So it's it's. I just think about what that's like to be living in community, and then just be like, oh, time to you know initiate this this um, holy earth surface walker, life bringer, life bearer, right now, and the whole community drop everything and come and bring all the resources in that moment on her behalf. I mean, it's huge, and I just think, wow, imagine every woman, <laughs> every woman having that go on behind her at that time. Um, so right after White Buffalo Calf Woman had given me this directive and I was all brokenhearted, my daughter went on her first moon time, you know, and we'd been trying to prepare for her. So my daughter had the second womanhood ceremony in our family in four, in four generations. And um, that was the beginning of me entering into my own people's way. And it was a really deep, fast um introduction to to our way and our people and and the elders who could accommodate you know who could i mean it's so interesting you know people so here i am a Diné woman living in the red willow people's territory i live in northern new mexico in, in taos and i'm following the lakota tradition so that's that's too messy for most people right like they just want to think that you're this people and you have this tradition and you know it and you follow it and I'm going to say that's even true for indigenous people, even though we should know our history. We should know that we were scattered. We should know that we we ran and hid and, and ended up in places like Mexico. We should know that we were taken into slavery in that moment of hardship by, 
by the Mexican people. We should know, you know, you know, the Mormons were stealing children and then taking them. You know, we should know that our history is like all over the place, but we still, even ourselves, want to act like it's all supposed to be so orderly. I'm like, this was attempted genocide. It was attempted genocide, okay? Like it's messy. It's messy. Awesome. So um, so I was just so grateful to meet some of my elders who could accommodate the reality and the messiness of who we were and and take us take us in and 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 help to teach us, you know. Well, that's I mean that's thank you for telling us that story. It's really incredible. And um, and of course, but for those who don't know, Buffalo Calf Woman is a very, very sacred uh, being in Lakota uh, tradition. And so she she actually introduced you to your own, she introduced you. I mean, it wasn't, I just heard that story as her not rejecting you, but introducing you to something else. Yeah, and, that was true. And, and, and then, and before we started our conversation today, you were saying that you had recently been made the steward of one of the sacred mount, one of those four sacred mountains that she was pointing you back to. So, would you be willing to tell us about that and what that entails? Yeah. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll back up and talk about my daughter's um, womanhood ceremony just for a moment and say. So, you know, I felt like here I am this outsider, everybody else is carrying on and knowing our knowledge. For some reason I got left out, I'm just out here somewhere and I'm gonna try to go back in to help my daughter have this ceremony. And um, and then I find out that hardly anybody's having this ceremony anymore. You know, I'm like reaching, I'm trying to find the people in, in, my, in my bloodline on either side. My, I wanted to do it through my mom's side because it felt like that's where we get our clans from, that would be appropriate. But that wasn't really working out. So then I went to my dad's side and I'm like, wow, nobody's doing this anymore. Like what's happening, you know? So we ended up going further out into our clan relationships to find that support. But um, I guess the reason I say that is because to my surprise, I was I was the one who ended up hosting many of my, because some of my family members came to my daughter's womanhood ceremony and it was their first in a ceremony that they ever went to. Me, like who would have thought I would be the one <laughs> to be that in that role you know and so so how that can work out that way and similarly you know um so the story about about taking on the stewardship of this land at the base of the mountain it's really powerful actually and so our there's there was a group of Diné youth and um they were looking at what's taking place on our reservation and uh so our reservation is what is now is in what is now known as the Four Corners area of Arizona, Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, right? And um, anyways, they were looking at this, and we have a lot of extraction, a lot of fracking, a lot of coal, a lot of um, anyway. Now, now helium has been discovered, which is a nightmare. Um, and so, uh, so the young people took a look at our tribal government. You know, one of I mean, I shouldn't get too political here, but this was pretty shocking to me. Our tribal vice president went on the campaign tour with um, Trump, you know, and I was just like, what? Because, yeah, it, that was like incongruous, okay, for in my view. <laughs> and so, so anyways, um, our young people were looking at our tribal government and saying, hey, you guys are selling us out. You're selling out our land for extraction and you're gonna end up making our land so toxic that we will no longer be able to live here. And when that happens, we'll no longer be able to be Diné. So that's that's a hard concept for modern world to grasp. You know, indigenous people can't just be, I mean, we were relocated and we held on as best we could to our traditions, our songs, our ceremonies, but, but they, the, you know, it was never the same. If we didn't get to go back and be in that origin place where the mother earth um, initiated us and and spoke to us and gave us those songs and ceremonies. They come from a specific place. I say culture is not a human construct. Culture is the Mother Earth expressing herself as human being in any given place. So culture is not a human construct. Culture is the Mother Earth expressing herself as human being in any given place. That's what it means to me to be indigenous. And so you know, you can't just pick up and move somewhere else and 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 carry on. It's it doesn't work like that. It, the the people on the land are synonymous. Um, their well being depends upon each other. 
in a, in a very deep way. And, and this is something that modern world wants to connect with, but it's, there's a lot of factors that make that difficult, including all the trans, you know, trans, transient, transient nature of modern world. Um, you, you don't have to be tied to place. But in any case, so where am I at? Um, so, uh, so they said, um, we reject you, these young people saying to tribal government, they said, we reject you as our leaders. And we also reject you as our elders, which was a really radical thing to say. And they said, so instead, what we're going to do is we're going to go and approach the original teachers, the original elders. We're going to go to the four sacred mountains and we're going to ask them how to continue on being Dene. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was really powerful. So they started out, at, I remember I brought up how the baby girl was found on the mountaintop and the holy people came and found her that was changing women. Well, they went to that spot. That's our origin spot, we'd say, maybe. And they walked from there to the first of the four sacred mountains, which is the easternmost of the sacred mountains. And they, and they, uh, this is like three, three or 400 mile walk, okay? And the reason that they, that they walked that, that distance is because in our, in our history, you know, in the mid 1800s, um, every male member of our people who could lift a gun ha was required to turn themselves in or could be captured or killed by the United States government. So they were rounding us up and they were walking us, we call it the long walk, they were walking us down to the southern part of the, what we now call the state of New Mexico to a place called Fort Sumner. Our name of, for it is called Hueldi, which means the place of suffering. And um, and And so, you know, we... We a lot of us perished on that walk. A lot of us perished in that place of suffering. Um, and then, in order to get out, we had to sign a treaty. And my my direct um, ancestors were some of the ones who ended up signing that treaty. And the treaty said that we would send our children to their schools. So that's where the residential boarding schools came in, right? And so that's how we got let out of that place. So then we had to walk back. So you know, these young people were saying, you know, you had that determination. You had that tenacity. You had that drive to continue on as Diné people. And we want our ancestors to know that we still have that tenacity. We still have that drive. We are still determined to continue on as Diné people. So we're going to walk. So they walked. And um, my daughter was on that walk um, as they approached the mountain. And there was a woman who was jogging. <laughs> she tells the story. The woman who was jogging, she tells the story. She said, there I am, this white woman jogging in my spandex. And I see all these native young people like hunkering down on the on this intersection of this street corner trying to have ceremony as they're you know getting close to the mountain because they don't have any other place to go at, at the base of this mountain all the land is privately owned or owned by by the u.s government right and uh, like a national forest or whatever and so she said um <clears throat> i approached them and i told them um i have land at the base of the mountain and i would be very honored to you know host you there um and and give you a place to have ceremony uh so that you don't have to be out here doing it on the street corner and um she was, it would be my honor so they took her up on it you know they went and um and stayed at her house and then my daughter um asked if she couldn't have a a, a ceremonial house built there she was getting her master's degree and and um she wanted to have a cultural summer school at each of the four sacred mountains and and she had asked the people what they wanted to learn and then one of the requests was they wanted to learn how to build the male version of the hogan and so she asked this woman and this woman said that would be the greatest honor of my life if you would do that so not long after that um the ceremony house was built there incredible unbelievable structure uh, this ceremony house right and um um and so a little bit after that uh the owners of the land realized they were going to have to sell and so by that time I had met them and and so they approached me and they said you know wouldn't it be great wouldn't it be great if Diné people could hold this land and I was like yeah it sure would but I'll bet you're not giving it away and they were like no we can't give it away and um and so I began to pray about it and, and ask you know and, and, and you got to understand okay so this is all part of a, a phenomenon um, that's taking place here in what we now call the United States, this superimposed nation state upon indigenous continent, um, in which um, we're talking about land back, right? Land back is a is a big movement right now. And so what does land back mean? It means different things to different people, but in a simple way, for me, it means land being restored to the stewardship of 
the original stewards who have their evolution as human beings, their cultures, their languages, their ceremonies um, in a particular place, right? And so, um, um, oh gosh. Oh, so, uh, so, so that's it, what it is in a, in a general way. And so individuals are returning land to indigenous peoples. I'm actually a part of working with a group of nuns in the United States. None, uh, you know, the Catholic church is the largest land holder in the mm -hmm. world, <laughs> in case we weren't clear on that. Um, and so these nuns actually can have autonomy in deciding what they're going to do with their land. And the median age of nuns in the United States is 84. It means nobody's signing up to be, hardly anybody signing up to be nuns anymore. So they're on their way out. So the question becomes, what will happen with this land? So we're working with them to find a graceful way for them to transition land to indigenous peoples and black farmers. Um, so land back is taking place in all different kinds of ways and, and also through purchase, right? So I wasn't really looking to be a part of Land Back necessarily. I mean, I certainly supported it, but it wasn't my thing, so to speak. And uh, so, but I got called in by spirit and the mountain, I feel like, you know, and so I was asking, um, you know, do I have a part in this? It was like, yeah, you do. And so I said, okay, well, I mean, it's crazy because it's like 140 acres. Um, so that's like big by my standards, that's gigantic. And um, so there was, so the scale of this whole, proposition you know i always say spirit loves to make outrageous propositions and sees who's gonna who's crazy enough to hop in the mix and try to see what could happen with it and and spirit's got my number spirit says well i'm just want you to know that if this were to happen and that were to happen then a great possibility for healing on earth could take place and spirit knows i'm a sucker for that so um so anyways the amount of money involved everything was just huge but i was like okay spirit i don't know how you're going to pull this off but i'll i'll put it out there and so i put it out there and um all the funds came in to purchase the land uh, mm. in 3 weeks wow like boom and so you know it's just like that to me said it, spirit wanted it the mountain wanted it so the mountain's been talking to me about what the purpose is I mean, the primary purpose is to give Diné people ceremonial access um, for prayers. And we actually did just have our first uh, round of sacred hospitality, hosting, hosting, hosting other nations to come. And they, they were returning seed to us that we hadn't had since before the treaty, since before the genocide. And so, you know, they wanted to do it ceremonially. So we had our first opportunity of sacred hospitality um, a couple of weeks ago. And, and so, so this, this crazy proposition just kind of has been working its way into reality and boom, it's now landed on earth. And I'll just say one more thing and then I'll come up for air. But um, uh, the other purpose is uh, I was told um, in vision about 10 years ago that I would start a place called, that I would, that I would have a school called Joy House, the School for Unlearning. And so um, that's also what's going to be taking place there. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of how it all got started. And there's a lot, you know, it's it's in motion. Thank you. I, I mean, I, it's fascinating the way you're weaving in um, your own story with the with your indigenous with the indigenous story with um, with all the 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 thinking and the beliefs that are woven in and out of it. So it's really fascinating. Harriet, I turn this over to you. You have, you had some questions that you wanted to ask. Oh, well, thank you. I'm, I'm actually following on Facebook because it's on live and some people have commented and just been so grateful. Thank you for accepting the shawl back, you know, Thank you for giving us the uh, the idea, uh, the 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 truth that culture is an expression of Earth, and that rootedness as part of humans expressing what Mother Earth is giving out through through the human experiences of life. I think that's something that I th that is really resonant with people, um, and that the, you mirror the heavens and the stars in the work that you do. So there's there's a great weaving that's that's coming up for people who are listening. So thank you for the comments. And there's so much. I I, I suppose I just want to have a, a a catch all to say everything that you speak of feels like making beauty in woundedness. Um, and mm. could, 
Could you speak? Yeah, like the what you said about the land back movement and the um, the stepping into eldership, um, and you know finding the male um, pl place um, the the um, the word I want to get it right the the hogan for the for the sacred masculine for for that. Could you speak a little bit more about that and um, because is that is that part of your work? The, the sacred feminine and the hogan for women um was was something when your children were younger and now you're moving into this this masculine state stage hmm. that is so interesting harriet because you're pointing out something to me that i hadn't noticed before <laughs> <laughs> and um um that's really funny excuse me so um Yes, that's exactly what's happening. Thank you for helping me understand what's going on here. Um, uh, so, you know, one of the one of the ways that I I've been doing work with gender, and um, as some people know, and uh, you know, I I I think the best way to sum it up is this. You know, when I was in ceremony, and this had to do with me coming into my elder woman years and coming coming into menopause. You know, and and what everybody told me was going to happen, that I would become invisible and I would be insignificant and all these things. And I was pretty riled up about it all. Plus, I was going through a lot of changes in the body, right? And um, but anyway, I'm in ceremony and I'm asking, you know, what do we mean when we say masculine? What do we mean when we say feminine? What are we really talking about there? Those words are so loaded, you know, but what is the essentialness of it that that's that's kind of outside of human construct? Like, what are we really talking about? You know, I'm trying to ask this. And um, and what came back to me was was something that that has changed everything you know and and the spirit said well that's a really good question now you're really on to something asking that question and and so you know you think you know what masculine is but you don't and you think you know what feminine is but you don't all you know is how those energetics behave in a power over paradigm but if you were to plug those energetics into a different paradigm they would behave in a completely different way hmm so you know, for me, I guess I got to witness and feel in the ceremonies um, how indigenous, you know, so I get I get dinged for talking about pan-indigenous, but there are just so many similarities. You know, I, I'm in indigenous ceremony with peoples all over the world, and there's a lot of similarities because we're, because our, our knowledge base is coming from the same place, the earth, right? And so, yeah, there's a lot of similarities. Every indigenous culture is distinct in so many ways. But there are commonalities, and that's what I'm referring to when I say indigenous worldview, um, you know, and the way gender is held, you know, there's, so the way I end up summing it up is I say my biology gives me a spiritual capacity, a very specific spiritual capacity, and there's roles that only I can hold. Um, and so one, one of the ways that I really went into that very deeply was um, understanding what my spiritual capacity was when I was menstruating. It was very, very specific. Nobody else can do what I could do during that time. Um, and so, you know, uh, I, I I wanted to tend to that. And I, and I learned a huge amount. I had seven years with my moon time in consciousness. And that was invaluable, invaluable to be able to, to, to connect with that. So then, of course, that opens up broader question. Well, if that's true for me, what's true of the elder woman? Once I'm beyond that, that became the next question. Um, you know, and I'll just say briefly there, you know, what I was told is you're in labor again, you're in labor again. And this time you're birthing yourself as the fruitful woman. Mm -hmm. You know, people think of the fruitful woman as the child bearing age woman, but at this point, there's so much more fruitfulness that, um, in, in many directions that you, that you offer. Um, and if you had been in a culture that had taught you how to sit during your menstruation time. And, and have a very specific, huge opening to the spiritual realms and also to receive direct instruction from the Mother Earth. Just imagine if you had sat and taken that time every month for what, the 40 years or whatever, um, before you go into menopause. You know, I mean, by the time you get to this point with this kind of hair, you are a force to be reckoned with. You are one of the most precious assets the community has. So, um, for instance, there's that, and um, and 
and then you know then I began you know it's a long story we don't have time for it at this point but um when I was called on another outrageous proposal of spirit was to ask me to address what took place during the witch hunts in Europe and um and in that process I really came to understand that the sacred masculine had been deeply deeply violated in that process as well it had been torn out um, of its archetypal spiritual um, pact or agreement and honor of being protector of the life bringer and the elders and the children and also provider um, and was and was traumatized into becoming something something else and those traumatized men who were made to watch what took place, you know, when the witches were found mm -hmm. guilty. They used to make the children watch, right? Um, it was the sons and grandsons of those men who ended up on the ships that came to us. Wow. That's how they could do what they did. They were, they were, they weren't quite present. And, you know, it took hundreds, I mean, the witch hunts went on for hundreds of years, right? That was the destruction of indigenous European way. That was, that was the way of making the circle move into the way of the pyramid. And that those methodologies, so one, it says the Europeans fought it just like we're fighting it right now as indigenous people. The fact that it took hundreds of years for this to occur. But also, you know, the methodologies for how to change the way of the circle into the way of the pyramid were perfected. And that also was then sent on the ships around the world. So um, a little note there, but but what but what happened for me was I ended up having an opening so deep in compassion around men's nation because I had been I didn't know it but I had been enraged the second I got here as a female <laughs> I didn't even know it it's it, I mean I was like a fish trying to see water um, but there was something about going through that process and doing the ceremonies to address that that helped me understand that, you know, we're all in it together and that we've been pitted against each other. You know, it's the divide and conquer. And it's the, and then that was a huge divide and conquer between masculine and feminine, between men's nation and women's nation. Um, but I, I stopped going for that bait at that point and really became very committed and very devoted to men's nation. And I guess I'll just, I'll stop on that subject by saying, you know, one thing that I, that I feel, um, you know, and I'm super excited about it. And actually, just as you're saying, what's happening at the mountains is teaching me a lot, a lot, a lot about it. Um, but I really feel that, you know, and, and this is extractive language, I got to find better language, but I'm going to say, one. I think one of our greatest untapped resources is the sacred masculine. We don't know anything about the sacred masculine because, I'm going to say in large part, because we equate masculine with patriarchy right but this structure you know again masculine is going to behave a certain way in this structure but that doesn't mean that's what it is essentially yeah so for me i have to separate masculinity from this and then but then that begs the question then what then what, then what? you know so we say we bad man we don't like you when you do this and that and the other thing here but we don't aren't giving any place for that medicine to stand. But it's here for a purpose, right? I mean, it's half of, or I don't know, it's it, it's a lot of what's going on on the planet in in all life forms is the masculine aspect, right? It, there's a, there's a huge medicine there, but what do we know about it? And so I'm very excited to discover what happens when the sacred masculine really gets turned loose on this planet. That's really that's really oh, that's really beautiful and inspiring. Um, we have to stop in about five minutes, but there's something that I really wanted to ask you about. You and I met on a, as part of a delegation to the Holy Land, Palestine yes. and Jordan. What an extraordinary trip. Yeah, it was an extraordinary trip. And we went to the Jordan River one morning, all, all of us. We went to the Jordan River and you did this beautiful prayer that completely changed my concept of water. And you talked about how the water in the Jordan River had been on the top of a mountain and it had been, the, it had been in the mouth of a dinosaur. It, and it was just like this ongoing life of water. And I wonder if we could end with you talking just a little bit. I don't know if you want to say it as a prayer like you did there or discussing it, talking about how 
water is water has this unending life is how I heard it. It would be my honor to speak about the water. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> and we can't speak about the water enough, really. So we say, Holy Mani, with chosen a wakan, sacred water of life. Um, and that water is the, the one that binds all living things together as one family. And um, so we say that that water is not only life. I mean, it's, it's our life. You know, we, we call it first medicine. So when you get really, really sick, that's the one you want. You don't want a diet Dr. Pepper. <laughs> you don't want a Red Bull. You know, although those are made with water, let's not forget, those didn't just come from somewhere. That took water. And that's a really important thing for us to remember because that's our that's our fresh water supply going, turning into Red Bull and Budweiser, et cetera. So got to keep track of that. But, um, but you know, that that water um, is the first medicine and it's, it's, it's our well-being. And um, and so we say water is not only life, but it's alive. It has consciousness, and it's carrying consciousness. So in in the scientific, my scientific book, and probably most everybody's, I don't doubt they've changed it. They talk about the water cycle of, you know, the oceans evaporating to the clouds, clouds drifting around, raining, raining on the mountain, water running down streams, coming down to river, river flowing back into ocean. Boom! There you go, water cycle. I say, whoa, hold on a second. You forgot something. <laughs> What's also happening is that water is also passing through every single life form. That's huge. So that so that water is actually understanding what every single life form needs in order to thrive and continually monitoring the life and what is happening there, including with the human beings. And so all of our all of our what we need for life, our understanding of life and our consciousness of life is also passing through that water. So that's collective knowledge. That's, that water is the same water that any one of our ancestors drank. And as you point out, you know, not only human ancestors, but flying ones, swimming ones, creepy crawling ones, four-legged ones, Tyrannosaurus Rex, as we said, has also had a drink of that water because it's always been the same water. It's cycling around. And so that also means all the ceremonies, all the people's ways, all the prayers that have been put in that water, they're still there. And so, you know, we're we're contributing our consciousness, our prayer, our ceremonies, hopefully, to that water at this moment. And that's going to continue on to the to the next generations, again, not only of human beings, but all the life. So um, water, very, very precious, very, very uh, profound medicine. We can't even know everything that water is, even though we like to just say H2O and think we know it. <laughs> Pat McCabe, Women's Den Shining, thank you so much. This is really beautiful. Oh, it's my honor. My pleasure. Great pleasure to, to talk with you. Yeah. Thank you so thank you. much. And just with that, I, I wish to say that we've been imbibing our water, sitting in a cafe together. We've been in the process of this great offering and gratitude of the waters through us. Um, and as we pass it to and through ourselves as it continues in the cycle may um for me at least and i'm sure for many other people that um there will be a prayer into the future with each gulp so thank mm. you so much for giving that to us in our cafe um and with that i thank everybody who's come thank you for the wonderful comments and the hearts and the insight noticing um, and thank you for your wisdom. Never stop sharing with us, says Emma Mary. And um, thank you again. And good good night to everybody. Good evening, good afternoon to everybody who's been in the cafe. And as we all file out of the door, the last person turns out the light and locks the door and we go on our merry way. So thank you again, everybody. And we'll see you next month when we talk again to somebody. Yeah, next month is we're talking on uh, July 26th, we're talking to Laura Schmidt, who was one of the co-founders of this amazing network, the Good Grief Network. So that's what's happening then. Thank you all. And goodbye until then. Bye, everybody. Thank bye, you. Bye, Pat. Okay.